Okay, hello again. So, so after this great introduction, um, I, I'm, I'm going to move us on to uh, some issues we have in, in weather and, and, and climate. And um, this, these, it's, it's, it's essentially how do you get um, how do you get performance? How, how do you get uh, productivity? And you'll, you'll see that these things are very important, um, particularly in, in the weather and in climate domain. Um, so, and these these things have, have come to be known as the three P's. I'm not sure where that came from. I must admit, um, perhaps if anyone knows, they can post that in, into the, the chat. But anyway, this the, the the three P's: performance, portability, and productivity is a is a phrase that's used quite a lot these days. So, okay. So, um, just a quick overview of of what I'm going to talk about. I'll go through each of the P's: uh, performance, portability, and productivity in in uh, in turn. Um, and then, then I'll, I'll talk about um, about how some of these things conflict with each other, which is the main issue, really. Um, and, and then, and then try and finish off with with what what um, people do in weather and climate modelling at the moment, the kind of practical approaches people people take to uh, to these things as, as sort of the state of the art or where we are at the moment. So in terms of performance, um, wh why do we care? Well, I, I probably, I mean, Simon's given a great introduction. Um, so um, we know we know we've got these big computers, but um, weather and climate is is what's known as a, a grand challenge problem. Um, a grand challenge problem is is one where essentially, no matter how much power you get, you need you need more, or, or you could make use of more. So you always need more resources. Um, that's, I think that was defined quite a long time ago, grand challenge problem. So, so weather and climate is one of these things. So, so what, what would people do if they had more power? Um, so essentially there are kind of three, three directions, three, three, three things you can do. It's pretty generic really. One is you can, you can increase resolution. Okay. So if you don't know what resolution is, if you see the, uh, the picture at the top, um, that that's that's the that's the world as you can probably tell. Actually, it's uh, you can't quite see it very well, I don't think, but um, it's it's basically split into lots of tiny little uh, in this case hexagons, um, and that's how we solve um, weather and climate. What we do is we split the world into 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 small small bits, and then we do computation on each of those bits and communicate between them. So basically, the smaller the bits, um, the more work there is to do, and you can you can see. You can see that at the bottom right. You can see that if you split, so that's just this is Europe, I think, with with possibly Iceland up there um, in Greenland. So you can see if you split the world into into small chunks, squares, you get a certain kind of accuracy resolution. But you know the UK doesn't even exist there. I know we're going out of Europe, but you know that's a bit harsh. Um, and then as as you kind of get more and more squares and more and more squares, you get better and better resolution. Basically, you get better science. So, so the, the smaller these things are, um, the the better the better um, quality your your forecast is is or your climate model is going to be, and um, but of course the smaller they are, the more computation there is. So increased res resolution means you need more more computation. The, the the second thing of course is is you might want to run for longer. Um, um, so um, you might want climate models to run for longer. You might want your weather forecast to run for longer. And of course these two things go go hand in hand. Um, and and the, the third one is is is, um, is is where there's been a big explosion really is is um, is the complexity of the science. So um, so this this graphic on the top right here is is trying to show you this. So so essentially um, these blue strands, this is time, 1950s, 1960s, 1970s, these blue strands are are different um, areas that people have been working on writing their models. Um, and as, as time's gone on, they've merged these things together uh, into one coupled model, so joined together to solve the problem together. So a classic one would be people have just done the atmosphere to start off with, and they just did the atmosphere, and they, they, they treated the ocean as if it didn't exist or it was constant or something. But of course, the ocean affects the atmosphere, the atmosphere affects the ocean. So people wrote ocean models, um, and then they join them together because they affect each other. And all these different strands of things get more and more complicated, gradually get joined in over time, and you get a more complicated system as you, as you go on. And, and that's, con that's continuing now. And, and you'll, th there'll be some discussion about coupled models um, this afternoon, so you'll, you'll hear much more about that. Um, but the point is, is the complexity of science is, is, 
um, is, is going up and up and up as, as time goes on. So they're the three things that we can always do. We can always do increased resolution, um, increased time that we can do, and, and increased complexity of science. Um, so, so, what, what, why, so that's why we need performance, one reason. Another one is that, um, of course, weather and climate is, is very important um, politically uh, and economically. People just think about weather and climate, oh, what's, what's the weather like tomorrow? Well, it's got a lot more than that. I, I made a list of things down, uh, down here uh, on my piece of paper. So obviously there's lots of military interest in that. You, people have boats and planes and things and they want to get them in the right place and know what's going on. Um, but of course, um, that's not just military, there's aviation uh, and shipping, there's farming. Um, of course, there are floods and storms, volcanoes, disasters. If there's a nuclear power plant that, um, that, that blows up, you might want to know which direction um, the nuclear fallout is going to go in so you can move out of the way. Um, there's insurance. So, um, so insurance companies make money out of, uh, out of premiums being high enough that, uh, that they cover their costs. And of course, if there's going to be more and more floods and storms, then they need to increase their premiums, otherwise they're gonna go bust. Um, and probably the big one, I guess, is um, decisions on climate change, because obviously governments need to make decisions now on, uh, on, on making sure that we don't overheat the planet. Um, and yet they want to keep um, the economic model going, they want the, the, the economy to, to um, fall through the hole. So they, there's this, this kind of, trade-off between the two. They're trying to find ways in which they can grow the economy, but also keep um, keep carbon dioxide down as much as possible. And, and models predict that. So that's probably one of the key ones. Um, so, so, so because of this, um, you know, there tends to be money available to buy big machines. Um, and, and, and we can use um, these, these largest machines, and they're very, very expensive. So another reason performance is because they're so expensive, of course, we want to get the best out of them. And, and, and the fundamental line of this is we want to get science per second. That's really the thing. The, the fundamental thing is how much science can get out of these things. We talk about megaflops and gigaflops and things and teraflops and exaflops. But in the end, it's science per second is the most important thing. Um, and and just, just to let you know where we are in, in terms of, I say we, the, the community, not me, um, is, is that is the, the kind of the grand challenge at the moment, the main aim is, is kind of working towards exascale is to be able to run models with one kilometer resolution. Um, so a one kilometer resolution means a square that's one kilometer. Um, and and if, if, you, uh, if you divide the world up into one kilometer blocks, you'll, you'll find there are half, about roughly half a billion of those. Um, and of course, we, the, the, the atmosphere goes up as well as horizontal. So, so uh, you tend to run around 100 things in the vertical. So if you multiply the half a billion by 100, you get roughly 50 billion cubes. That, um, and that's the kind of problem that uh, size we're, we're talking about trying to solve on these big supercomputers, or 50 billion, or up to 50 billion. OK, next slide, sorry. So, so one, one example um, is, is the, uh, so we work closely with the Met Office, so we, we tend to have information from them, and, um, and these, information is I think the slides are from Chris so thank you for that. Um, Met Office currently run um, using three Cray XC40s and, and they have half a million cores in total on these machines and, and, and as you might expect the electricity bill for these becoming more and more important is, is very very uh, very high on these things. Um, they, they need a three megawatt power supply which is pretty big. Um, and, and they use this for climate and, and weather, ocean modeling etc as I said before. Um, and just to give you some figures, I mean, this is a headline figure, so I wouldn't take it too much um, in terms of the, pro but um, this, this is the amount of money that they're going to be getting for 10 years in total, the Met Office, but they've been allocated 1.2 billion over the next 10 years. So it's quite a lot of money, um, but it's, of course, a very, very important um, area. It can, can affect our lives, whether we essentially survive on the planet, really. Um, okay. So, um, when we talk about, so the next one is performance. Um, and when we talk about um, performance, really we mean performance portability because it's okay. It's okay. Um, so, so, so it's okay just to get portability um, because that means you can just run on one machine and run on another machine. But if it's really slow on one machine, it's not, it's not really useful. It's portable, but it's not useful. 
So what you want is you, you, you need portability, of course, but, uh, but you also need the performance to go with that as well. So when, so when you hear about uh, the three Ps and portability, I think you need to think performance portability. Um, now, actually, if it's just one institution, let's just say the Met Office, and they have one machine, then they could, in theory, just optimize code for that. Um, and, and not worry about anything else. And, and, and that, is, that is one mode of operation that people have used in, in the past. Um, but models tend to be used by more than one institution, actually. Um, and those institutions might have bought different machines. They might use different machines. Uh, actually, even in the same institution might have different machines, but that's, that's, uh, that's aside, it's not usually the case. And, and those machines might have different compilers, um, and they might even be running different configurations of models. So, so um, you need portability, uh, performance portability, so that these different institutions can also run the model efficiently on their machines. Um, uh, another thing is that um, models are developed over a very long period of time, decades. Um, and, and, but, but supercomputers themselves tend to be upgraded much more, much more frequently, maybe five years or, or, or eight years or something like that. So, so actually the software, uh, in terms of time is harder than the hardware. The hardware is soft and the software is hard in that sense. So you need your model to be able to um, run on the current machine, but also on the next one afterwards. And so you want to avoid a big porting cost if possible. Uh, so having it performance port portable will make life much easier. Um, and, and lastly here, um, so it's, it's actually something that people don't think about. It's quite important is, is if, if you're tied into one class of machine, you can only run on one style of machine. Um, and then you go and try and buy a, a machine from a, a number of vendors. Uh, if you've only got one vendor that can supply you that machine, then you're not necessarily going to get as good a deal. You want, you want multiple vendors to be able to sell you something. Um, and, and of course, the reason that you care about that is because if you have more machine, you can do more science. So that's actually quite an important point. Um, if we move on to productivity, the next P. So um, one of the things about weather and climate models, uh, I think as I kind of um, said earlier, is they're, is they're, very, they're very large codes. Um, they're scientifically very complex. Um, the, the UM, so the UM is the Met Office's current weather and climate model, stands for unified model because it's unified between weather and climate. Um, and that has approximately 2 million lines of code. So that's the kind of order of, of size of, of um, a number of lines of code that people are working on. It's very complex because they have to do all these things over here on the right. All these different processes need to be, to be modeled. Um, and of course, they're modeling them more and more. Um, and the other thing is, is, is the code is continuing being developed. It's not just that you make, you run the code, um, you create the code, you run it for years and years, you're continually improving it and developing it over time. And there's not just a few, one or two contributors. There, there are many, many contributors to this code, often from multiple institutions. Um, so, so Alfric is, is the Met Office's next generation um, weather and climate model they're working on. It's not used at the moment, but it's being developed. And even though it's being developed, it already has 10 to 20 scientists developing it, um, as well as a core team of five to 10 software engineers. So, so um, even, even that, which is just being developed at the moment, has a, quite a large number of people who have to coordinate and collaborate together to, to, uh, to develop and build this thing. So it's a very large, complex system. Um, and, and, you know, pro for productivity, of course, you need to keep your development time down as, as, as little as possible. If you're a scientist, um, you want to be able to, to produce science as quickly as possible and, and not have all the side effects of bugs. Um, and, you want, and of course, you need to understand the code when, you, when you're changing it. So the code needs to be readable as possible. Um, and, and I guess fundamentally, the code needs to be to, to act because, I mean, we all know that, but the point is, is that it's easy for bugs to go in there. You need to make sure there's time involved, making sure that these codes are correct. Um, because obviously, if, if they're not correct, then uh, then there can be big uh, big issues about that. So um, uh, one, one more slide on productivity. Just just uh, just as to kind of illustrate more about the community as well. So. Um, you have domain scientists who, who are trying to put new science into the code, um, and, um, and, and they, but they may not know much about performance. Uh, they may do, but, uh, but not necessarily. And, uh, and then you have the HPT experts who are trying to make the code go fast, and they may not be the uh, they may not be domain scientists. They may not know so much about the science. And so they, those two need to kind of talk to each other and understand each other and be able to to, um, 
to, to work together. So, that, so it's not just the fact that um, you have multiple people working on it, they, they also have different expertise as well, which makes it hard as well. And just, just um, maybe this is a, a sales pitch really for anyone out there, um, it's hard to get good people. Um, partly because of salaries, but um, it's just it's quite a specialist area. So, um, you know, if you are interested in in um, in, in, in working with, uh, with with weather and climate models and things, there are there are opportunities out there um, and, um, you know, you're um, you'll be very welcome. In fact, some people here might already be working um, in some of these centers. Um, and just to say what well, the productivity problem is, is really um, our engineering problem. It's um, so so you really need to worry about software engineering practices, um, re repositories, version control, coding standards, code reviewing, test suites, those sort of things. So that's what productivity is really about. OK, so I've, I've, I've said these three things that they're, they're the, uh, the the three P's. But so what's the problem? Why can't we just do all of them? OK, so the, the problem is, is that, uh, is that they conflict with, conflict with each other. And, and this is. Uh, Classic example of where you can't do what you want. If, if you're at university or at school or something, um, most of you can remember that better than I can. But you, you want to get yourself some very good grades at the end of it. One of the reasons you, you do this. But of course, you want to have a great time as well, because it's a great, you know, great time. Um, and and, and of course it's very hard to do both of these things, because you also need to sleep as well. So, so the, the joke is, is you can choose two of these things. Um, you can't have all three of them, you can only have two. Um, of course, you trade these things off, of course, don't you? You don't just choose two. You are going to sleep a bit, you are going to have a good time a bit, and you are going to try and get as good grades as possible. There's trade offs between these things. Um, okay, so the point is from that is there are conflicting goals. And um, in order to get fast code, you might need to break your software engineering practices. Um, and the problem is, is that optimized code can be hard to understand and hard to extend, but it's faster. So it's, it's better in terms of going fast, but it's worse in terms of understanding and maintaining. So it's just a simple example of this is um, if we have um, the good software engineering practice, we might want, I mean, typically you, you, when you write an algorithm, you're going to separate it into bits and you're going to put it into functions and we use those functions and uh, it's much easier to, uh, to maintain and, uh, uh, and to test. Uh, and and uh, so, so that's a great way to do things. But actually, um, at the lowest level, sometimes um, this can affect performance. A classic optimization technique actually is to inline functions um, because functions have a stack frame um, and, and impose a runtime penalty, but also they, they act as a, an inhibitor to optimization. So, um, so a, a compiler may not be able to optimize across these things and optimize within them. If you're in line, then you can get better performance. So, so an example of where people have done this um, in, a, in a model is, is in, the, in the dynamical core of ICON. So, so ICON is the German Weather Service's atmosphere model. It's used by the German Weather Service, but also by other institutions. Um, and uh, the, the kind of the, one of the core functions in there is actually quite long, long code, 3,000 lines. And, uh, and what they've done is they've actually pasted something you'd expect a triangle solver. You'd expect that to be in its own, um, its own function, own subroutine, but actually it's been pasted right into the, into the body. To get performance, so th that's a trade-off where they've gone for performance over readability. And so, so these trade-offs had to happen. Another example um, is, uh, and and you got this from Simon earlier, which is which is brilliant. So the point is, is that when you optimize your code, um, a fast code may be different on different architectures. So if you optimize your code for a, a traditional CPU-based machine, something like this. That's the uh, new Fujitsu processor. That's a, a multi-core or many-core processor. And the code is going to look quite different to if you optimize it for, for a GPU, and this is a new 800 um, and over here um, from NVIDIA. So, so if, if you want to get performance portability, essentially, you need multiple versions of source code. You need one which is going to run fast on this and one which is going to run fast on that. Now, clearly, that's that's very difficult to uh, to to, main, to maintain because if you're adding new science in, you don't want to add in science into two different parts of code. 
because you're going to get problems. Um, and that's why sometimes you see um, source codes fork um, and you get different source codes going in different directions. You'll see people have got a GPU version of their thing and they'll have a CPU version of their thing and they're different. And you really don't want to do that. Uh, okay, you can't see my screen pointer. Okay, sorry. Um, I'll, can I just do that? Uh, pointer, okay. Perhaps you can see my pointer now. Sorry, I've been, I've been pointing at things, you've not been able to see them. <laughs> Um, so, um, so what people can do is, you, is, is, is people often put model code and, and they actually add lots of conditional compilation um, and directives in there to try and get it to work on different architectures and work well. And so there, there's a trade-off here between, uh, between software engineering and, and add end performance. And, and if you have all these um, conditional compilations, it makes it very hard to test because you have different uh, depending on which which um, which switches you have, it's going to be faster or or, or, or slower. Um, sorry, which switches you have, um, it's going to go different paths through through the um, through the code. So it's very hard to test all these different paths. Um, so again, if we take take the uh, the Icon Dynamical Core, the the German Weather Services model, they um, and you look at their um, the main function, uh, the, the kind of the, the core function, that has 46 if defs in there for conditional compilation and, um, and, and uh, 426 um, um, directives in there to support OpenACC and OpenMP. And, and if you remember, OpenACC is evil, apparently, from, uh, from Simon's previous uh, presentation, but it's there. Okay. So what do institutions do at the moment? I've kind of alluded to this a little bit. Um, essentially, there are um, you have to make trade-offs between the, the, the three P's. Um, and, and what different institutions do is slightly different. Um, traditionally, and, and, and people may disagree with this, is very broad brushstroke statement. So uh, you know, there are lots of nuances to this. But traditionally, the Met Office emphasized, have traditionally emphasized scientific performance. So the scientists uh, are, the, are, the, are the kind of the lead, as you'd expect. And, um, and then you try and get performance after the scientists have, have, have done their, their bit. Um, whereas the NEMO consortium, so the NEMO is, uh, is, is a well-used uh, ocean model. So that's a picture of the NEMO ocean model up there. Um, and it's used by many, many um, different institutions in Europe. Um, they tend to emphasize scientific performance uh, and portability. Not performance portability, but portability. I mean, obviously, they want performance portability. Um, and as a result, NEMO, for example, NEMO will only run um, with MPI uh, or, or in serial. They, they have no directives in there. So, it, so it, the, as, as things stand, it will not run on GPUs, for example. That's a, that's a decision, essentially, that's been made for, for um, software engineering reasons, really. Um, and ICON, as I said before, and you'll see examples of this later, um, that runs on um, both CPU and GPU. But it does require multiple directives, and that does affect maintenance. Um, and because, I mean, they actually do get good performance, but not necessarily highest performance because they have to make these trade-offs. And, and overall, there are very few models out there that run on GPUs. Um, most don't still, um, and people still typically optimize for their own architectures, um, and then and then try, other people try and get performance out of it separately to that. Um, one thing you can do is you can make optimizations configurable. Um, so, so basically, you can have something that is um, in the code, and you can you can you can structure it so that it will work well on different types of architectures. And blocking is a good example. So you can chunk your problem up, make it small enough to run on a, um, bits of C CPU well inside caches, but also to make your block size quite large for GPU. So that's one kind of way you can control your code. So uh, in, in summary, um, we have weather and climate models that are very large and complex. They're developed by large teams of people used by multiple institutions, and they need to run on some of the biggest supercomputers. So we really do need all three, performance, portability, and productivity. But these aims conflict with each other. Um, and people have to make trade-offs between these three things. Um, so and at the moment, quite rightly, um, and, and I think always, Scientific uh, performance, is, it has to be the first strongest driver. OK, so, that, so that's it. This is just uh, saying what's next. Um, so we're going to have an introduction to DSLs next uh, and then have our break. 
uh, and they'll be in, then they'll be dawn and then cycling afterwards. Okay, so I so I I finished my presentation on this. Um, as a moderator, I have to see whether I had to ask myself questions. But uh, I think as a result, um, looks like there's been lots of discussion on um, on the previous presentation. Are there any um, questions on what I've talked about? Um, if not, we'll move straight on. I think we're just about on time, so it might be worth moving on anyway. <laughs>